morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode 390 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Monday, May 27th, 2024. And uh, I'm not quite sure what kind of day it's going to be here, but we uh, had a really, really major cloud burst around four o'clock in the morning that just soaked everything for about like about a solid 10 minutes and then stop. That's it. (laughs) So, uh, and it's a sort of grayish and as you can see, there's no, there's no Aurora Borealis, try that again, Aurora Borealis behind me. So, um, yeah, not quite sure exactly what we're going to get, but I'm still your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, eh? And with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. Ooh, yeah, it's pretty gray there too, eh? Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's 20, it's about 20, 20 degrees right now, so it's not cold, but uh, it's not exactly pretty out right now. I don't know what the day is going to bring us. So, yep, not at all. No clue. It's been it's been shifting a lot, uh, but yeah. we had a gorgeous weekend. So, yeah, go. it was a beautiful weekend. So, we'll take that. Yes, indeed. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, the Pepper Master, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health today? Um, hmm. I had a breakthrough and a setback at the same time. How's that sound? It was uh, okay. Like a, yeah, I, I, I sort of yeah. an epiphany moment, but it 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 it, uh, it kind of knocked me down at the same time. So it's a realization, uh, something I've come to terms with, and I'm still trying to deal with completely. But it's. Uh, hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a bit of a setback, but a but a realization at the same time. So it's it's difficult to describe. Um, I can't really put it into. I can't contextualize it any better than that. Really, to be honest with you, it was a mm-hmm. uh, you know sort of like an epiphany moment. Like oh, oh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> if that helps. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. See, and, and that right there, kids, is what I, uh, when I talk about uh, communications, you know, when it's just written word mm-hmm. or when you just have the sound, but not the visual. Yeah. How there's like 70% of the message is like not in the words mm-hmm. themselves, right? Facial expression, tone, how your eyes moved, like when you, you know, all that. That's what makes it all up. So these are all the things, you know, when, when I'm analyzing stuff in communications, I'm looking at all of that stuff, right? So, oh my God. Yeah, I, I yeah, I know that, that that's, it's kind of, um, yeah, it's exactly. I said, yay, huh? 
kind of feeling because it's sort of like there's an epiphany and a realization. And usually when that happens, there's usually a change and usually a change for the better. Usually. Usually. However, um, you have to go through something that sucks. Yeah. To get to the better. Exactly. All right. It's like, there's the suckage in life that's totally unnecessary. And then there's the suckage in life. That's the that, from which growth comes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's like, but it's still suckage. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it is. so yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I hear that. It's like, and it, it's, it's funny. It's like that can happen, you know, with your mental health and, and that can happen in things like just trivial things or everyday things like even just like sports right Mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's like oh my god this is the best i've ever played you know i'm really like i'm I'm, like i think of myself in tennis it's like it's my fourth year and it's like wow compared to like when i started in the first summer of covid holy crow i'm a totally different person and i still get on the court and i still get beaten eight zero in in 22 minutes by someone (laughs) despite all that right it's how it rolls. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, yay me. Oh, gee. Oh, none of my new tricks work against this guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, yay me, I got better. It's like, uh, yeah, but he got better too. That's <laughs> usually how it works. <laughs> usually. Yeah. yeah, I know. But yeah, with the, but I mean, yeah, when it comes to mental health and when it comes to, to mood and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's exponentially higher level. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm sending you all the good stuff for the, the suckage time and, uh, hope to be there to share in your joy when you get to the other end of it. Thanks. It's, uh, it's a bit of a journey. It's just, it's just yeah. something that, uh, I don't know. I just had a sudden realization the other day and, uh, it was, uh, hmm. How do, you, how, do you, how do you put it into words? It's something I knew about, but not something I realized, if that makes any sense. It's like... Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't realize what was happening at the time. After the mm-hmm. fact, with many years later of hindsight, it's like, oh, that mm-hmm. was wrong. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 There's a, I remember there was a moment with my, my mom. So I, I think I mentioned on my show, my mom suffered from schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. Um, and it happened when I was six. And when I was six, it was like, my mom is so badass, mm-hmm. Right. She'll stand up for me. And then it's like, I'm like, 50 something now, but I mean, it happened before that. It was like, oh, yeah, I, I see how that could violate a law or two. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, ooh, that, that, wasn't, that, that was not the wisest choice. So, yeah. 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 You, uh, if, interpretations of events sometimes shift with time. Yes, they do. Yeah. Hindsight being twenty twenty and all, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and then what you knew then versus what you know now, mm-hmm. too, right? We all make the only that we could. All of us can only make the best decisions we can with the best information that we happen to have at the time. Then later on, you find out more information. You go, oh, I should have made a better, better decision. Well, that's that's a waste of time. You. You didn't have that information or you had no way of having that exactly. information then, right? So there's no sense in beating yourself up for not having made a better decision then. And that in, in those cases, we, you, you make the best one you can. We hope we make the best one we can at the time with the information we have. <laughs> you know. that's, about we, that's, that's about the best we can do. Right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Think so. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, also a uh, Kit Pete in the chat there, and yes, uh, having some job interviews and stuff like that. And uh, you know, it's uh, when you're hunting for a job, sometimes you got to 
kiss a thousand frogs before you meet a prince. So, <laughs> so it's one of those situations. But yeah, you know what? Turn you on because uh, everybody here knows what good work you do. So it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. Uh, I, Kid Pete says, sending the hugs, Paul. You're an ace bloke. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. <laughs> All right, kids and cubs. Uh, let us get to the news. Um, I have oh, no yes, idea to place this weekend. I literally I, unplugged. I, I do. Uh, one thing, though, Kit Argosi, uh, uh, I saw in the chat uh, before we start that uh, you had a bit of an accident. If you do have the option and the means, uh, go to, uh, if you can get an appointment with a physiotherapist, or if you believe in chiropractor, but a physiotherapist, uh, because you might have been had a couple of muscles that got uh, pulled out of alignment, and the quicker you uh, act on them, the better it is. Because if you don't, sometimes, um, and I'm speaking from personal experience here, uh, things set in the wrong place, and then you continue to move, and that gets wrapped around in the wrong spot. And uh, 10 years later, you're hunched over or pulled, or you can't turn your neck or something. So uh, if if that's an option to you, uh, please, uh, even if you're not feeling anything, uh, do go. Because sometimes it shows up a few years later. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, kids and cubs. Uh, and this is me speaking as a dancer as well. So just, yeah, sometimes you don't feel things get pulled, but things get pulled and it's not fun. All right, kits and cubs in the news. It has been a busy, busy, oh. busy week. The one thing I do know and, about, and I'm sure we'll get to okay. is... Um, the 225 million plus another 345 million in uh, expenses that uh, Doug Ford has just dropped. So that, you know, how it was supposed to be beer and wine in yep. corner stores in January 2026. Well, he just paid 225 million dollars to end the contract with the beer store, and it will start on September 5th of this year. But the LCBO will have to pay another $345 million in royalties to the beer store, which puts it at around $600 million, I think, of taxpayers' dollars just so we can get beer and wine in corner stores. Except the corner stores won't be mom and pops. They'll be big chains. <sighs> All to please his corporate overlords, the supreme puppet masters of our um, corrupt premier of Ontario. This is, I think, in October, all grocery stores can opt in as well. So, yeah. Unbelievable. Can't get a doctor. So, People yeah. can't get a doctor. Health workers, healthcare workers, many of them haven't had a pay rise in a few years. But hey, 600 million bucks, no problem. <laughs> that was the only thing I read about this weekend and I was just like, why am I not the least bit surprised about this? He's just trying to buy the next election, except I don't think this is going to work because too many people see what's happening. After the Greenbelt scandal and now this, uh, let's, let's not even call into uh, question the therm spa on the former Ontario place lands, which is public property, by the way, and has been given a 95-year lease to a private corporation, and they're building a $600 million underground parking garage. <sighs> they, they, the numbers that they expected to go through this spa on a, on a daily basis and throughout the year far exceed that of any place in all of North America. <laughs> yeah. See, and, and this is something I've seen before. Because, because when the city of Montreal was chosen to host the gay games, mm -hmm. yes, they presented a budget right. to the Federation of Gay Games. Because, and in their budget, the Federation of Gay Games, they somehow assumed that they would get greater attendance than the cities of San Francisco, New York, or Amsterdam, which hosted them before. Mm -hmm. And while Montreal has a world-famous gay village, 
Largest in North America. Yeah. Um, it, it, and it is a cosmopolitan city. Mm-hmm. It is not a gay mecca. No. Such as is Amsterdam mm-hmm. or New York San Fran or, or yeah. San Francisco. Uh, so they were presenting a budget that would assume that they would succeed better than everybody else in terms of getting attendance. And and then, well, Federation of Gay Games said, well, that, that's not reasonable. And then they broke away. And then they started the out games. Wow. Well. And that was run for a while, and now there is no more out games. Yeah, I wonder why. So, lofty um, ambitions without realistic expectations. I mean, you know, Mm. you have to. It's like somebody somewhere asked the question, "What is it about you, organizers of Montreal, who think you can do so much better than Amsterdam, than New York City, and?" I went to the ones in New York City, and when I was there in New York City, it was also in New York City, the 25th anniversary of Stonewall. Oh, wow. Barbara Streisand was in town giving concerts, and the World Cup was in the United States yeah. all at the same time. So there could have been a lot of gauge there <laughs> to come participate at the gay games. Some some raw tonnage for sure, right? And I was sitting there, was like, you think you're going to get a bigger attendance than New York City with all of that going on? No. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and things went as things went, right? Of course they would. So, you, you know, you have to... Uh, you, you have to be realistic. <laughs> Budgets are supposed to be conservative exercises, right? Where you overestimate what it is you're going to spend and you underestimate what it is you're going to bring in. And then if things work out for the better, yay. <laughs> right? So, uh, but yeah, uh, I, I've got the, a bit of the article there. It goes, uh, I think it was, uh, yeah. Rob Ferguson with Robert Benzie in the Toronto Star. Mm -hmm. There will finally be beer and wine in corner stores after Labor Day, and Ontario's long-awaited liberalization of booze sales in supermarkets and big box outlets should be completed by Halloween, thanks to $225 million payout to the privately run beer store. Quote, We are delivering on our commitment to give consumers in Ontario the choice and convenience every other Canadian enjoys, and we're doing so even sooner than we had originally promised, Premier Doug Ford said Friday at an Etobicoke convenience store. The surprise move would give the Premier the flexibility to call a snap provincial election in 2025, a year earlier than the scheduled June 2026 vote, because he will have kept a key campaign pledge. When Ford unveiled the plan to give additional choice for buyers of beer, wine, cider, hard seltzer, and premixed cocktails on December 14th, he concealed it might take until 2026 to implement due to the long-standing agreements with the beer and wine industry. But taxpayer-funded subsidies of up to $225 million to the beer store, which is majority owned by breweries Labatt, Molson, and Sleeman, over the next 19 months expedited the process. That cash is designed to, quote, protect jobs. Doug's. <clears throat> and maintain the foreign-owned company's retail footprint as liberalization unfolds. The move was denounced by a, quote, disappointed Retail Council of Canada president and CEO Diane Brisebois, who represents major grocers as a, quote, sweetheart deal for the big multinational beer companies that won't help supermarkets. The beer store will continue to be paid to oversee recycling and bottle returns for all alcohol beverage containers until 2031, and the publicly owned Liquor Control Board of Ontario will maintain its monopoly on spirit sales such as whiskey, vodka, gin, and rum. Private retailers who can begin applying for licensing on June 17th will buy their booze from the government monopoly. They will get an interim wholesale discount price of 10% off LCBO retail prices until 2026. Under the new timetable, up to 450 supermarkets that were licensed to sell beer, wine, cider, uh, sorry, beer, wine, and cider by former Liberal Premier Kathleen Wynne in 2015 will be allowed to sell premixed cocktails like Neutral, Aperol Spritz, White Claw, and Dylan's Small Batch on August 1st, as well as those, grossly ath- those grocery outlets, which are currently restricted to selling beer in six packs, will be able to offer cases of 24 that only the beer store has been permitted to sell. After September 5th, all eligible convenience stores will be allowed to sell beer, cider, wine, and ready-to-drink alcoholic beverages. 
and after October 31st, eligible groceries and big box stores such as Walmart and Costco will be able to sell beer, cider, wine, and pre-mixed booze. The government will continue to impose minimum price restrictions to thwart any attempts to cut price sales, although private label products could be available in 2026. The province's Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario, AGCO, will police the liberalized system. I do not know what private label products are. Don't know. I don't know if that's an entry point for something, but anyway. Quote, in the coming weeks and months, people in Ontario, like many Canadians across the country, will have the option to responsibly and conveniently purchase a case of beer or bottle of wine on their way up to the cottage or to a summer barbecue, all while having even more opportunity to support local Ontario breweries and wineries, the Premier said. For a teetotaler whose government last week announced stiffer penalties for those who drink and drive and has previously pledged over $10 million dollars no, sorry, has pledged $10 million over five years to promote social responsibility, emphasized it was a time Ontarians, Ontarians were treated like grown-ups. Finance Minister Peter Bethan-Falvey, who counts on the LCBO to generate around $2 billion a year in profits to, to provincial coffers, echoed that. Quote, Our responsible and balanced approach treats Ontario consumers like adults by giving them more choice and convenience while also supporting Ontario retailers, domestic producers, and workers in the alcohol industry, said Bethan-Falvey. Quote, as we launch this new marketplace, we will continue to meet, consult, and work closely with industry partners, local beverage alcohol producers, and other stakeholders. When liberalization is finally completed, there will be an additional 8,500 booze retailers in Ontario. Currently, there are about 2,935 outlets, including the LCBO 685 locations, plus 389 agency stores, 422 beer stores, 449 supermarkets, 526 wine retailers, 373 craft brewery shops, and 75 distillery stores licensed to sell booze in the province. As well, about 19,000 bars and restaurants have been permitted sales of alcohol to go since 2020, thanks to pandemic-era changes implemented by Ford's former treasurer, Rod Phillips. Huh, interesting that those weren't rescinded. Yeah, they... they um... They tried to rescind it, and I think they made an augmentation so that you have to purchase food, and that uh, they added on. Well, you have to have a food purchase. You can't just buy beer to go. And that didn't last long. That was struck down, apparently, because now you can just order beer to go. Oh, cool. Philip's move, which was intended to help small businesses cope with COVID-19 restrictions that prevented them from operating normally, has led to the opening of hundreds of new boutique bottle shops. Last Christmas, Ford and Beth and Falvey announced Queen's Park would not renew the 10-year master framework agreement with the beer and wine industry when it expires on December 31st, 2025. The winding down that accor of that accord signed by Wynn means the progressive conservatives can finally keep their 2018 campaign pl pledge of beer and corner stores in time for the next election. So it seems that of this $600 million, there's a portion of it... Uh, there's two portions, one that's $225 million right. and one that's $375 uh, million. Uh, One of those is to help with ensure that the recycling can still continue even though... Um, so sales example, will be non-existent. <laughs> yes, but for example, if you're buying your bottles at the grocery store, you can still bring them back to the beer store. Yes. Right, for the recycling and whatnot. So they're still going to be responsible for that. So they're going to have to do more recycling because they assume there'll be more sales from more outlets. So part mm -hmm. of that is for that. That part I get. Mm -hmm. That part I get. It's one of the most successful recycling programs ever. Yes, and it started in like, what, the 50s? or something? Right. It's been going on forever. Yeah. So, I mean, that part I, that part I have no problem with. Mm -hmm. The other one is basically we the taxpayers foot in the bill, which should probably be a party expense, mm -hmm. uh, of clearing the decks so that he can call an elect a snap election one year early if he feels that that's going to be in his best interest. And uh, I am going to guess that with this man, more time for more news to leak out about more of the things he's been up to probably wouldn't be good so yeah i can see why he would want to try to get another majority after three years rather than after doing four mm. so uh right now we may be paying one of those fees i'm not sure which one it is uh i guess 375 million whichever of these yeah. in order to make sure that uh if he wants to go to a snap election you can say hey i kept this promise and bought them out mm-hmm 
So considering um, he proactively had to approach them to buy him out, how much do you want to bet the amount of money that was offered, the amount of our money that was offered is probably more than the value of it? Oh, guaranteed. You can guarantee that. Take it to the bank. I mean, come on. This this man... And Again, I don't have facts because I don't have an assessment of what the actual value would be to compare it to, but... Come on, it's Doug speculation. Ford. Well, I mean, business. Yeah. If you want out of... You know, it's like, if you're in a contract with someone and someone wants out of the contract with you, that's one thing. But if you want out of the contract with them... Mm -hmm. And they have no need to let you out of the contract whatsoever. Uh, it kind of becomes a name your price situation, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I'd say so, yeah. I'd say so. No, I'm not saying that the beer companies, depending on how you look at it, if you look at it from a left side, uh, unscrupulous enough to be able to take the extra money or if you look at it from the conservative side just good capitalists enough to strike while the iron was hot mm -hmm. <clears throat> you might not like the players you might not like the game but in this uh, instance it seems that it is uh, Premier Ford that set up the checkers board Yeah. Yeah. Color me unimpressed. I mean, look, the idea that I can walk to the corner store to get a pint if I want one, I'm not going to lie to you. That appeals to me. It does. Mm -hmm. It has for decades. I lived in Quebec for a long time, so that was what I was used to, right? Yeah. And if you're not in the big cities, if you're like rural northern Ontario and all that kind of stuff, your, your small convenience stores are like this. This is probably great for you. Oh yeah, there, well, and you do, there you, are some winners here. You you do have like there are some uh, LCBO outlets within small corner stores, right? Mm -hmm. I know of a few around this area, so there is a, a winning aspect to it. But I think on the other end of things, it's the money being spent was totally unnecessary. Could have waited till 2026. Didn't have to pay it off so soon, number one. Number two, this might add to some problems people have with alcohol when it's not oh, yes. more widely available, right? And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm, that is a concern to me. That is a concern to me that um, this could be, could be a bigger problem. Now, is it? I don't know. Let's ask the problems of Quebec. They've been... Having, they, I mean, it's been available in corner stores in Quebec for what seventy years, if not longer. I'm not even sure how long. More than I've been alive, I can tell you that. So let's let's you know get the numbers from Quebec to find out what the status is on that. And in Quebec, if you want um, better quality wine and hard hard liquor, you know, you want liquor harder. You know what I'm trying to say, whiskey. Gin, mm -hmm. vodka, spirits. you need to go to the SAQ. Spirits, thank you. That was the word I was looking yeah. for. You need to go to the SAQ, which is the yeah. uh, Quebec's version of the LCBO. Yeah, that's going to be the same here too, except yes. for mixed yeah. drinks that you'll be able to to get. Like if you're, 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 you're matzah, matzah Caesar cocktail in a can, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you'll be able to get that at the corner store, the mixed drinks, but you won't be able to buy the vodka no. itself. No, um, the pre now, cocktails. Here's the interesting thing about Doug Ford and this, because I remember, I'm old enough to remember, oh, was it last week, um, when uh, Doug Ford uh, bellied up to a microphone and said decriminalization is a, quote, absolute nightmare that will, quote, never happen under Ontario's progressive conservative government when it comes to drugs mm -hmm. other than marijuana and alcohol yes, now which are both ford, drugs by the way yes this is why i'm linking them both ford made the comments to reporters on friday amid a national debate over the policy which was recently rejected in toronto by the federal government it's an absolute nightmare it would be a disaster as long as i'm premier we're never sorry it would be an absolute nightmare 
It would be a disaster. As long as I'm premier, we're never going to decriminalize hardcore drugs. Like my Doug Ford. Ooh, mm -hmm. I like that on the bottom. That is groovy. Groovy graphics. I like it. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's just a change. Huh? No, no, it looks good. I like that. I like that way better. It's cleaner. It's crisper. Um, sorry, I have to sneeze. Go ahead. Um, Here's the British Columbia's, thing, there we go. British Columbia's pilot project began in January 2023, and of course, the BC Premier David Ibby expressed concerns about the escalating situation because people were doing drugs out in public. Um, conservatives are trying to paint the decision as being a reversal of the whole policy. It actually isn't. It's just basically a tweak of the policy to make it clear that even though you can still possess it while you are in public, can't actually use it <laughs> in a hospital. Apparently, this needed to be said. Um, so, um, yeah. But uh, so Doug Ford, he was praising Premier E.B. as well, saying that he was so proud of the Premier for reversing that big mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, he also thanked Ottawa for giving the jurisdiction of that into the hands of the province because Ottawa said that, you know, it's like, listen, if provinces want to do it, we're going to help them. If provinces don't want to do it, we're, still, we're, we're not going to impose it on them. So when Doug Ford was making the big stink, like saying, you know, like this, oh my God, we need to fight Ottawa. And it's like Ottawa was never saying it. It's not like Ottawa was going to Toronto and say, going to Queen's Park and saying, we are going to force you to do this. There are the city of Toronto was asking for it, which is different than the case mm. of British Columbia, because the government of British Columbia asked the government of Ontario, uh, the government of Canada. This was the municipality, the city of Toronto, and of course, cities are the constructs of the provinces. So, for that type of thing, so there was never any danger. By the way, if you're a conservative from Ontario, of Justin Trudeau changing the law to decriminalize. Yeah, that it was in Ontario it was there was never any danger. Doug Ford was fabricating something to fight against that didn't actually exist. He constructed a political enemy. Big surprise. It's a common, it's a common thing in politics. Right? You construct the enemy you want to fight, and then you fight it, rather than your actual opponent. So yeah, uh, so here's the thing. Now that we know that Doug Ford does believe in safe supply mm -hmm. and safe access, right? Is he going to change things? Treating people like adults mm -hmm. when it comes to mind altering substances that can do a lot of damage and harm mm -hmm. when abused. I, I am, I'm, why can't we just apply that across the board? Oh, no, that's a, because that doesn't feed into his narrative. Like it needs to feed into his narrative so he'll have uh, something to use to blame the prime minister for something that only is a provincial matter. <laughs> I mean, uh, Linda, Linda's got it right here. Ford believes in safe supply of alcohol he doesn't use, but not drugs he used to sell. Ooh. Ooh. Ouch. That's a good one. Damn. That's a good one. Cold-blooded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Kit. You know, usually I give beaver points for funny stuff. Mm. Uh, that, that, that's a solid 50 beaver points. <laughs> Seriously, wow, damn. Gee, don't don't meet up with Kit Linda in a back alley. She just brings a baseball bat. Oh yeah, <laughs> she'll give you a thumping. She'll give damn. you a thumping. So, talking about um, premiers who are, um, how would you put it, performatively strutting. Mm -hmm. 
Premier Blaine Higgs. Oh, no. Nova Nova Scotia. Scotia. Yes. Uh, it seems that um, he has uh, gotten wind of Higgs, a... Isn't, isn't Higgs New Brunswick? New Brunswick. Yeah, New Brunswick. Yeah, you said Nova Scotia. I was confused for a moment. Oh, did I say Nova Scotia? I'm sorry. No, yeah, New Brunswick. Sorry. Yeah, screwed up. Sorry. Um, yeah. It seems that um, there is a group that came to deliver sex ed presentation at high school. And, uh, well, I guess some people took some pictures or something. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, but, um, anyway, he has a picture from it and he put it up and it's a group that's uh, called, well, the presentation is called thirsty for the talk. Mm -hmm. So it's questions that kids of that age would be asking, uh, if you will, uh, put up, uh, the thing, Mr. Grizzly, you'll see that there's an image there. Just a second. Uh, that kids might ask uh, that I'm guessing some uh, very offended virgin parents or premiers, I should say, in this case, yeah. uh, he uh, he thinks that these are, um, uh, I guess, outrageous in some way shaped form questions now the questions uh for people listening who are not seeing uh is it normal to watch porn like people watch tv series do girls masturbate is it good or bad to do anal does it hurt when you do it for the first time and uh well blaine higgs uh went off if you would like to read his tweet mr grizzly sure thing let me just scroll it up and and, and be uh please be sure to be uh do it in a performatively outraged a uh, number of concerned parents have shared with me photos and screenshots of clearly inappropriate material that was presented recently in at least four New Brunswick high schools. <gasps> Today, I am furious would be a oh. gross understatement. This presentation was not part of the New Brunswick curriculum and the content was not flagged for parents in advance. My office is told by Department of Education officials that this was supposed to be a presentation on HPV. However, the group shared materials well beyond the scope of an HPV presentation. The fact that this was shared shows either improper vetting was done, the group misrepresented the content they would share, or both. This group will not be allowed to present again at New Brunswick schools effective immediately. Our government will have further discussions about whether additional rules about third-party presentations need to be updated. Children should be protected and parents should be respected. I want parents to know that we are with you. We will continue to make decisions based on the principle that parents need to be aware of what is happening at schools so they can make informed parenting decisions. Do you think we need stronger rules about third-party presentations in our schools? I want to hear directly from you. Take our survey by clicking here. NewBrunswickPC.ca backslash school. <sighs> Lane yeah. Higgs is furious because somebody's actually trying to answer the questions kids are actually asking. Mm -hmm. Can you tell there's an election? Yeah. It's reactions like this to kids asking about sex that make like everything awkward and silent and it's like mm -hmm. if the kid asks a question the kid is old enough to get an age-appropriate answer and we're talking about high school and probably some of them are already having sex because or have been sexually active mm -hmm. either against or with consent because some of these kids might be asking questions because something happens that they don't want to tell about but they're still worried that reality also exists oh yes so it's like when a kid asks an adult about sex and you give them the answer 
Then the kid walks away with the answer, especially younger. If you start getting all weird about being asked the question and having to provide an answer, then the kid learns that sex asking or anything about sex is weird. Mm -hmm. And hence, you start down the road to unhealthy sexuality. If you want the kids to trust you, Premier Higgs, you can't freak out like this. Exactly. Kids have questions, and right now they're opening up their newspaper. Well, not the newspapers, because kids. <laughs> they don't read the newspapers. <laughs> but they're going online. <laughs> and then they unfold the map and wind up the clock. <laughs> Sorry. But, but they're going online and they're seeing the premier of their province freak out because they asked questions about sex. What do you think that tells a generation of kids? Like, it's like so totally the wrong message. It's like, if you want your children to come to you with their questions about sex, then you can't make it weird when they do. Mm. Because kids are curious, and if they want an answer, kids are kind of determined. They'll find one. I mean, look at what they did to Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. TikTok generation screwed him over. Have well. you ever heard of Greta Thunberg? Mm -hmm. Right? She was a kid. She's a lovely young lady now, but if kids are determined and want to know, they're going to find out. And if you're going to make it weird, again, you're driving them directly towards sources that may not have their best interests at heart. Mm-hmm. You can't be weird. Just talk about what is healthy sexuality, consent, and knowing that no is always an option like it's normal mm -hmm. because it is. Well, you know, you get mad because they ask questions. What does that tell you about him? No, and then get mad because someone wants to answer them honestly. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't like that. You do realize that a lot of kids will not go to their parents to have that discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tessa Nor Teresa Norris is the president and founder of HPV Global Action, and she did presentations at four high schools last week. In a Sunday evening interview with CTV News, she said work the work of our organization and what the presentations were really all about is being grossly misrepresented. Quote, New Brunswick, alongside many other provinces, have adopted a curriculum to deal with sexual health issues and the presentation that I delivered and that I have been delivering in your province for years in several places across the province all of a sudden is now deemed inappropriate because somebody decided to take an excerpt from that slide and create a story around it, said Norris. Mm -hmm. A photo from what appears to be a recent presentation was attached to Higgs' post. It showed a slide from a presentation by Thirsty for the Talk, which Norris also operates. Norris said Thirsty for the Talk is an external resource that offers youth evidence-based information they can access instead of going on the web to have their questions answered. The slide had four chat bubbles with questions as, is it normal to watch porn like people watch TV series, as I read to you on all mm -hmm. the others. Higgs said his office was told by officials from the P Department of Education the presentation was supposed to be on human papillomavirus. HPV, which is HPV. HPV is a common sexually transmitted infection that can, in some cases, cause several types of cancer. Quote, and as Mr. Grizzly said, however, the group showed materials well beyond the scope, blah, blah, blah. Effectively, immediately, the group will not be permitted, blah, blah, blah. Norris said she didn't take kindly to, healthy, to the Healthy Relationships 101 presentation being looked at like it's inappropriate. Quote, particularly after the amount of work and integrity that goes into it, so I think I'm disappointed and it would be nice if this could be reflected, said Norris. Nora says she's been to dozens of schools in the province over the past 10 years to do the same presentation and added the Department of Education does a good job at screening external groups that come to New Brunswick. Quote, we were vetted. We're on your list of organizations that can come into your province. What we cover in that presentation is gone over. All of the issues that we cover are discussed, said Norris. Schools are given an information sheet outlining all the areas that are going to be covered in advance and consent forms are signed. 
At no point was anybody under any illusion that I was going to be specifically talking about one specific thing, said Norris. Norris wouldn't say which school she did the presentation at because she says there's already too much attention directed toward them. Higgs stated his government will further dis have further discussions about whether additional rules regarding to third-party presentations will need to be updated. Uh, yeah. So basically, uh, the organization is saying that uh, he's lying. Mm -hmm. And given the track record of the government on this file, especially when their minister of education claimed that he had so many letters. But were there three? three? Uh, a freedom of information request uh, showed that there were three, I think. And one of them was the one about the litter boxes. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we're not even sure if the three that were written actually came from people or whether there's three people in the office wrote them themselves and then sent them in to say that they had some. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know, man. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, they're trying to bring in that uh, their policy 713 again, which is mm -hmm. they're the ones who kicked that all off on sexual orientation and gender in schools. One of the major changes is that children who are under the age of 16 and identify as transgender or non-binary will not be able to officially change their names or desired pronouns in school without the consent of their parents or guardians. The decision has caused controversy among many LGBTQ plus advocates who believe the changes make the policy more discriminatory. And the province is currently in a legal dispute with the Anglophone East School District Education Council over the changes. So it seems there's a school board that's taken the province to court and said, nope. We know this is bad. So again, more of your money, New Brunswick. Wow. Earlier this, and and here's, and guess what? Not only this, this, this is how ornery and destructive they're willing to be. Earlier this month, Education Minister Bill Hogan announced he would attempt to dissolve the Education Council over litigation fees. Just, you dare sue us? You dare run up these costs? Fine. We're going to dissolve you, which is going to create a whole other legal battle. <sighs> There is no amount of money they will not spend to keep someone down. In this case, trans kids. Mm -hmm. The council is in the process of taking oh, the council is in the process of taking the province to court over the changes the Higgs government made last summer. Higgs has repeatedly said he stands by the changes and they are taking a strong position for families. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So, uh, conservative premiers behaving uh, badly here. Um, wildfire update: kids and cubs. There is some good news. Uh, thousands of people living in northeastern British Columbia will be able to return to their homes, as we were reported uh, last week. I guess it is the week before. It's about uh, five thousand people, about four thousand seven hundred more closely, uh, from the Fort Nelson area in British Columbia that uh, had been evacuated uh, more than two weeks ago. Uh, but the roadblocks will be lifted at 8 a.m. local time. Fort uh, Nelson Mayor Rob Fraser said, uh, I'm relieved because it's looking like the initial stages of this fire, uh, the safety concerns that we have have been mitigated to the point that we're going to be able to make an announcement to bring everybody home. The wildfire weather forecast on Sunday in BC said that there's a chance of thunderstorms over the next few days, however, which raises concerns about gusting winds and lightning strikes. Um, and it's been a, uh, a weekend for natural disasters throughout the world because uh, there have been major storms and tornadoes through uh, the Midwest uh, in the United States. 18 people were killed across several states. Uh, hundreds were injured in funnel clouds that were spotted in parts of Texas, Oklahoma. Uh, Kentucky is under a state of emergency. Uh, and there are uh, excessive heat warnings also places in uh, several other states. Uh, the Indiana, Illinois, um, Midwest. Alaska, I think there's, there's a whole bunch of them that are under uh, tornado watches here. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, strong winds and heavy rain were hitting the Bangladeshi coast. 
and uh, there was uh, four um, uh, where, when a tropical rainstorm uh, Ramal made landfall. Uh, four people were killed. Millions are without electricity. It's the first cyclone to hit the region this year because we've been talking about warmer surface waters, and so mm-hmm. there's already hidden. And then in Papua New Guinea, uh, it is believed, according to the National Disaster Center, that more than two thousand people have been buried alive wow. under mud and debris because there was a huge landslide through Anga Province. Uh, so. Yeah, there's Mother Nature's not happy. No, no. Mother Nature's not happy. Let's go back to Alberta for a second here. I got something I want to share with you. Um, this is um, it's at the uh, what are the, the I, I guess this is a carbon tax. Encampment in Lacombe, which is uh, just outside of Red Deer, so it's between Calgary and Edmonton. Mm-hmm. And this is uh, a video of some people complaining that, uh, well, look, it's two minutes and five seconds that you need to watch because it's like, oh boy, who's going to tell them? Well, e- e- even here in our own country, in our own province. You know, you're out there waving a flag. I'm almost going to make a sign that says, if you give us the middle finger for standing up for you, then you're a part of the problem. There's just so much evil out there and hatred. It's And I used to say, think, well, maybe it's just mis- miscommunication, but honestly, I think it's, um, I don't, I don't even know how to explain it because we all are going through so much and even those people that choose to be very negative they don't take the time to actually come and or get to know us or or anyone else that's going through that they don't get or take the time to actually know you or hear hear you out um they just shut off from you completely and um they don't want to hear you they don't care to hear you they chose to post that they chose to torment or they chose to stalk or whatever you have it they have chose to do that so it's a path that they've decided to go on and it's not your fault but you know the crazy part is it's not young teenagers that's right it's these not. are these are grown adults that act like children that's the more polite way to put it. It's like even driving down the road. It's like, and, and people messing with the signs and people giving us the finger. They're not teenagers. You know, when we're young and, and you know, just, you just causing mischief and blah, yeah. whatever the case may be. But it, these are adults that act like teenagers. Childish. Millennials and baby boomers. Crazy. It is. But that's okay. <laughs> that, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay, you're right. So, I just, what do you even say to that? It's like, let me see if I get this correct. You are suddenly asking for sympathy because people are expressing to you what they're feeling about what you're doing. They, they just, (laughs) they just don't get it. And it's not kids either, it's adults. Yeah, because we're sick of your shit. Get a fucking job. God damn it. Like, I just... <laughs> Listen, I... <sighs> Here's the thing. <laughs> I... I don't know how to put the... It takes all kinds to make a world. So Mm -hmm. in that group, you've got the Pat Kings. And Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've got some people that are the sweetest people that you could probably ever want to meet. Like this. And they've just been led down so many Mm -hmm. paths Mm -hmm. and whatnot. And they literally just do not understand why. Like, it's like, why won't they just come and talk to us? 
like find out who we are, treat us as people. I get that because we're quick to be dismissive. And, mm -hmm. But, like this, and you know what? Them too, I'm sure like we could like, you know, sit at a table, have a wonderful steak dinner like this, have great conversation, exchange back and forth that we feel, get to know each other and whatnot. Uh, and then there's the side of me that's like, have have you ever encountered a freaking mirror? Nope. I'm. <laughs> Do you watch yourselves? No, that's 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 the thing, right? They just don't. They don't get it. Yeah. You know, they came um, here and tortured lot, tortured me lot. and my friends and neighbors for weeks on end, and thought they were in the right, and thought they they don't they don't feel they did anything wrong the entire time they were here. The, the utter lack of self-awareness. Exactly. I just, oh. Uh. They're like, we're getting discouraged because not enough people are supporting us. It's because people have finally seen the light and realized you've been brainwashed into believing things that simply aren't true. <laughs> and if anybody brings up a discussion with you and tries to say, well, look, here's the thing. What you just said is factually incorrect. Here's the truth. I don't believe you. That's mainstream media, lamestream media. You've been brainwashed. No, the, these are the actual fact. No, you've been brainwashed. I don't believe you. So how do you have a conversation with somebody like that? Oh, man. Then... Um because we're talking a lot about these protests versus other types of protests, different treatment mm -hmm. that they've received. Um, it is 7.58 a.m., mm -hmm. uh, which would mean that uh, the students that are participating in the encampment at the University of Toronto have about uh, two minutes to clear, to clear the encampment, uh, even though the titch, the pens have been uh, sorry. Let's try that again. Even though the tents have been pitched, I said that, I was saying the pens have been titched. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> even though their tents have been pitched for about uh, four weeks now at the University of Toronto, it seems that uh, administration has let them know that they want them gone. By this morning, negotiations continued with uh, the pro-Palestinian protesters over the course of the weekend, but they are say that they are saying that they are going uh, nowhere. Trespass notices uh, were issued to encampment protesters, along with uh, stating what the deadline for uh, encampments to be clear would be. Um, the tents have taken over King's College Circle at the University of Toronto. According to CBC, organizers are calling on the university to divest from companies providing military goods and services to Israel to disclose its investments and suspend ties with Israeli universities. Uh, one of the students protesting, Mohammed Yassan, says the protest is deeply personal because he's mm -hmm. got family in Gaza. He says, we will not be tired out. Our students have canceled things. They have put their entire lives on hold to do this. So what's a trespass order going to do? Nothing. Right. Nothing. If, if we're not going out on Friday nights and if we're not hanging out with friends and if we're not, you know, playing sports and if we're like this, if we're sitting here, if we're camping, if we're giving up being young adults and teenagers and all this, good, like for this, we asked you to leave. No. Okay. We asked you to leave with papers. Please. Still no. <laughs> like, especially, again, if the context is some people saying, please stop killing us. Yes. Or please stop killing people, if not us. Um, you know, it, it's not like uh, uh, I'm upset that I got chocolate cake instead of vanilla. People are actually dying. Yes, there's a big difference. Right. It's even different. It's even different than I'm upset that my student fees went up 10% mm -hmm. in one year. Right. Uh, so it says that the university has presented organizers with an offer 
Uh, it rejected the calls to cut ties with universities, but included offers to create working groups to consider the demands for divestment and disclosure. A spokesperson for the uh, incumbent, Aaron Mackey, says, we don't have six months to wait to go through this process and procedure, only at the end to be given a no. Uh, she basically says, we are not interested in committees. We're interested in commitments. I think the kids are pretty much clear and uh, understand how the game is played. Well, I'm not why don't you ca- undo your encampment and we'll, we'll have a meeting with the committee and we'll discuss what it is you want to do and see what it is possible. Shall we do that in uh, two months? Mm. They know how this game is played. They're yeah. not dumb. It's like, no, no, not committees, commitments. University President Merrick uh, Gettler says that uh, the university will follow its existing policy for considering divestment requests. It makes no sense for us to respond in the moment to people who scream the loudest, and that is essentially what is happening right now, he says. Uh, Chris Marciano, who's the founding director of the College Crisis Unit Initiative at Davidson College, North Carolina says that divestment can be complex, but says protests like the one at the University of Toronto and many North American campuses could make a difference in other ways. By dominating the headlines with Prime Minister Netanyahu mentioning student protests in North America in recent speeches, students have gotten the attention of the Israeli government. Let's see if they can keep it as as commencements uh, start and continue, he says. Uh, some uh, Jewish groups say that the encampments can't end soon enough, uh, that they're very intimidating, and it creates a harassing environment. That universities across all the province, as that universities across all the province have allowed to continue for far too long. Uh, this weekend, the Ontario Federation of Labor, through its support behind the protesters, encouraging labor union members and their allies to join protesters for solidarity rally today, uh, this morning. Uh, student protester Sarah Rosak says it's, quote, it's um, that she's happy for their support. Basically, uh, I've noticed that if they do call the police to raid us or to come in on us, you will have the workers ready to mobilize and defend us against the University of Toronto. Uh, the University of Toronto has warned students that there could be academic and legal consequences if the encampments continue. Uh, despite that, it seems that there has been no real movement from the students uh, at this end. They basically said uh, that they are not going, that they will stay until until their demands are met. Uh, Again, University President uh, Merck Gartler said that he respects the right to protest, but it's time for the encampments to end as there have been more and more incidents involving reports of discrimination. Um, So... Um, it's also to note that there were two universities in Quebec that have already applied for injunctions to remove encampments. So far, both of those have failed. Uh, and, uh, and then in Alberta mm-hmm. uh, earlier this month, um, well, they basically, yeah, yeah, they, they send in the people, people were, uh, forcefully dispersed. Uh, and that has led to, uh, I guess people expressing no uh, vote of no confidence in the, the president of the University of Alberta. Mm-hmm. Looking it up here, I heard that on the news. Uh, yes, the University of Alberta's Arts Faculty Council passed a motion of non confidence on its president's leadership. Uh, let's see what I got here. Uh, so uh, it's a. Uh, The person in question here is uh, Bill Flanagan, the president of the University of Alberta. And uh, so this is the governing body of the one of the largest faculties of the University of Alberta. And uh, they voted 56 to 7 with seven abstentions in non-confidence in the president of the university. Quote, most of the people in the room wanted to send a message to him that they're not happy with his leadership, said Andy Knight, a political science professor and provost for provost fellow for black excellence and leadership who voted in favor of the motion quote he's going to have a very difficult time leading the institution 
The vote comes after a series of public calls from students, faculty, and alumni for Flanagan to apologize or resign over his response to the, response to the encampment, which was set up May 9th and forcibly removed after the university called police on May 11th. So they got two days. University of Toronto's over three weeks, McGill's over four weeks. Yeah. They got two days before they called in the cops. Two. How long has Lacombe been? The Lacombe protest is uh, in its second now. week. Second or third week. No, oh, I think it might even be longer than that. I'm not uh, sure. Yeah. The, I, this this, this Lacombe protest, this mm, newest one, yes. might be uh, only two weeks from what I was reading when, you, when, when she was uh, speaking and I was uh, looking things up. Uh, David Kane, a political science professor who put forward the motion, was also present during the encampment as a go-between for the student organizers and university security. He said the camp was completely peaceful and the justifications offered by the university, which he addressed in a seven-page letter to the Board of Governors, are absurd. Quote, the president is the most senior decision maker at this university, said Kahane. He was faced with a peaceful political assembly and protest for which constitutional law professors have said there is a high constitutional bar for clearing. CBC News reached out to the university to ask for Flanagan's reaction to the vote. A spokesperson said only that, quote, the president has had meaningful conversations with faculty, students, and staff, and will continue to do so over the coming days and weeks as he focuses on the needs of the university community. According to multiple people present in the virtual faculty council meeting, Flanagan himself appeared at the start of the program to offer remarks and answer questions. Quote, there was a lot of negative reaction to what he was saying, said Julie Rack, a professor and H.M. Torrey chair in the English and Film Studies Department. Quote, I believe poorly received is a very good description. <laughs> Kahane and others present said that there had been no plans for a non-confidence vote at the start of the meeting. Mm -hmm. The motion came about organically due to Flanagan's remarks. <sighs> That feeling when you go in to smooth things over and make things better, and then I guess you open your mouth and insert both foot at the same time, and you didn't yeah. have to bring some salt to help for the taste and a glass of water to wash it down. Uh, Kahane and others uh, said that the motion came about organically due to Flanagan's remarks. Quote, people in the meeting room openly told him, we have lost faith in your leadership, said Rack. After Flanagan left, the conversation continued. Quote, we thought we need to send him a message about how we're feeling after this meeting, and the best way to do that, we thought, was to take a vote. The motion approved by the faculty council states its lack of confidence in Flanagan is due to his decision to call EPS, quote, to clear a peaceful political protest, his failure to provide, quote, compelling evidence of the camp's danger, and, quote, his inaccurate and damaging statements following the camp's removal. Flanagan is seeking a second term as president when his current appointment expires next year. Mm, I think you may have fastened your seatbelt, Mr. Flanagan, because that might be a bumpy ride. Strap in. Yes. Uh, the saga began on May 9th when protesters established a makeshift camp on campus, resolving not to leave until the university engaged with their demands. They called for the university to disclose its investments and cut any ties with Israel. They also wanted the situation in Gaza declared as a genocide while calling on the federal government to end military contracts with Israel. Um, so student organizers have said that the University of Alberta leadership never engaged with them directly before camp's removal and that their conduct was peaceful. Since then, they have waged a pressure campaign against Flanagan with social media posts and protests and called for a third-party investigation into decisions that led to police being called. Rack said there was a stark contrast between Flanagan's words at the council meeting about the university's, quote, culture of care and the police response. Quote, the culture of care shouldn't involve shooting pepper spray bullets, she said. You think? logic is uh, kind of insaleable on that one. Uh, <laughs> Knight described himself as, quote, one of the biggest supporters of Flanagan in the past. Now he's considering resigning his provost fellow appointment due to the conduct of Flanagan and the university leadership. Quote, it's been very awkward for me to stay in that position, he said. It makes me feel like I can't be a hypocrite anymore if I'm advancing these causes and then working at cross purposes. And uh, at McMaster University in Hamilton, it seems that the encampment there has come to a deal uh, with the university. Uh, in their case, it seems that um, they are going to be willing um, to take a meeting. So while at the University of Toronto, uh, they said, um, we're interested in commitments, not committees. It seems here uh, that uh, McMaster is going to try working within the system here. Um, uh, 
Uh, let's see. McMaster University says the student-led pro-Palestinian encampment that has grown on campus over the past two and a half weeks is ending after the school and protesters agreed on terms. The school's update posted Friday said that there was a series of meaningful discussions that led to the decision. The university says the students agreed to remove tents by Saturday evening and not form another encampment on campus. Quote, McMaster has voted to accept an offer, organizers of the encampment said in an online statement late Friday. Quote, we secured commitments that begin to align with our principles of human rights and social justice for all. The groups, McMaster Apartheid Divest Coalition and Solidarity for Palestinian Human Rights, that's a mouthful, or SPHR, have been demanding McMaster disclose its investments connected to Israel and the war in Gaza and divest from them. On Friday, McMaster said its new commitments included having its International Strategy Advisory Committee develop a framework for human rights considerations in international agreements, meeting with its chief financial officer in June about the school's investment strategy with SPHR in attendance, annual disclosures of all direct investments and the names of the pooled funds held in the school's investment pool to the Board of Governors, inviting SPHR to present on divestment to the Board of Governors, creating an open process to allow questions about the school's investments, making up to $200,000 available to support qualified Palestinian academics and students under the school's Scholars at Risk program and Students at Risk Bursary, and publishing a series of stories about McMaster students impacted by conflicts and crises, including Palestinian students. The ending of the encampment is in contrast with most other encampments on school campuses. Some have seen universities file injunctions on demonstrators, issue trespass notices, or police cracking down on protesters. So basically, we've had four... We have campus protests throughout the country, and we've seen four different ways of handling them. Crackdown mm. after two days. Go through committees with a group of students that's willing to do that and see where that happens. I guess let the camps go for a couple of weeks and then issue trespass notices. Mm-hmm. Like this, while offering committee meetings to people who don't really want them. Yes, or just go to court and filing injunctions. That fail because, as stated previously in the article, like this, the constitutional bar to dismantle a protest is really high. Oh, yes. Because it's a legitimate form of political speech. And as we talked about when we're talking about, when we were talking about the federal court decision uh, about uh, the occupation in Ottawa, this, there is additional responsibility to protect political speech. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, complex, yeah. to say the least. Huh? Yep. And uh, the students at uh, the University of Toronto were uh, caught in interview saying, well, I, I guess that's okay for the students at McMaster. Or maybe their discussions went different with the, their people than us. But uh, yeah, that's not going to fly here. <laughs> we want commitments so that is what's going on on that front so uh, i would expect that later on today in the news uh, we will be hearing about stuff going on at uh, the university uh, of toronto as this is going on um oh yes i did have some stuff uh, other stuff from the university master here um who oh. was it uh jasmine a protester that wouldn't give his name says uh, that not all of their demands were met, but it's a good first step and negotiations weren't easy. Quote, we put a lot of time, effort, blood, sweat, and tears went into this. And at the very end, we're so glad to just finally have a resolution and we have concrete steps to work with in the future. So, uh, yeah, again, two different, uh, two different ways to go about it. Uh, but, uh, and, and we'll see how they play out. It, it's a laboratory right now. Mm-hmm. I guess hopefully uh, something good will happen out of one of these ones and then it will become the standard playbook. One would hope. Mm-hmm. But you notice, you notice, and Josh Ray had the same problem in Quebec, when it's the students that start protesting, how they just don't know what to do. Yeah, funny. Huh? Because students are not dumb. Right? They're at university, they're at college. They had the grades to get in. Mm-hmm. Well, one would hope that they're not dumb, but 
Just because you're in university doesn't mean you're smart. <laughs> hmm. No, no, yeah, but I mean, the the Venn diagram, mm-hmm. right? Um, they don't completely overlap. But <laughs> well, no, because so much these days is like time just to to create a system where you can get into university. You know, there's entire programs dedicated to you need to do this, do this, do this, read this test, take this, blah 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 blah. So, you know, it's they're they're creating factories. Um, there's an entire industry created uh, to to get kids into university. When we do need to start recruiting more uh, people into college and and trade schools because we just don't have enough tradespeople right now. But hey, I get it. It's not for everybody. It really isn't. Um, and we really I do worked, need to focus on trades. We do need to focus on trades. But I understand it's not for everyone. It really isn't. Um, some people can do it. Some people can't. You either have an aptitude for it or you don't. Number one and number two, you can either do the work or not. You might have an aptitude, but you might not be able to adhere to the work schedule that is slapped upon you when you walk on a construction site. So, you know, there's a lot of, not everybody can deal with the noise and the filth and the the uh, brutality that can be. And I don't mean brutality from other coworkers. I mean, just construction sites are brutal, period. They're brutal, dangerous, dirty places. And not everybody can deal with that. And I get it. You know, I did it for a long time. I did it because I had to, and I was good at my job. But I just, I don't ever want to set foot on another construction site as long as I live. And I sincerely mean that. I just, I'm done with it. I'm done with it. Oh, yeah. Here's a palate cleanse. Oh, these yeah. Are, these are um, a particular brand, brand, particular breed of... Um, monkey i guess i say monkey but i shouldn't say that they're there's saficus and uh well they they don't get around on all fours so they hop about i've had to mute the sound because we got a copyright violation but this is how they get around i think they're really cute oh my god that is so adorable <laughs> yeah it's they like just bunch of monkeys though they just dump yeah <laughs> <laughs> They are yeah. gorgeous, yeah. too. Uh, didn't remember this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Zuboom Mafu, I guess. And here's a couple more. Just checking out the camera. They're really cute. I thought that we'd just uh, have a little palate cleanse there. Oh, my. Damn. Animals being cute, doing cute things. Horrible. Yeah. Lemurs. Is that what they are? Lemurs? Uh, yeah. Lemurs? Well, they, they're saying... Uh, Safikas, S I F A K A S. Okay. Safikas. Yeah. I, I think that's how you pronounce it. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, Safikas. And then, of course, we have a. Let's see, we got a, a two monkey gangs clash in the city of Long, Lop Buri, Thailand. And uh, yeah, that's just a bunch of monkeys in the street <laughs> taking over the street, literally. <laughs> it's kind of funny oh wow there's so many of them I'm not going to put it on the screen it's too much it's confusing anyway there are many types of lemurs yes I do understand that so Safika is, is, is a new term I learned today on a Monday right. morning uh, Mr. Grizzly um, mm -hmm. I think this is something that I mean hope Hopefully the kids have already heard this, but if they're not, this is news that I'm very, 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 very happy to bring you. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, if you would uh, play this. Oh, this this clip from the Libertarian thing convention? Yes. No, now, do you not find it funny that there's a Libertarian convention? Yes. <laughs> Wait, you, you don't believe in government, but you have a convention to... To pick a nominee for president. Anarchists of the world unite. Yes. <laughs> Do you not see the irony there? Combined with us in a partnership, we're asking that of the libertarians. We must work together. Combine with us. You have to combine with us. We cannot give crooked Joe Biden four more years. We cannot give crooked Joe Biden four more years. Anyone can talk about defending freedom, but I've actually put everything on the line to resist 
these despots and these stuff. And I stand before you tonight as your best hope of defeating the weaponized Biden. United, we will be unstoppable. If we unite, we are unstoppable. I will be a true friend to libertarians in the White House. It just, it, a libertarian convention to pick a presidential nominee. It, it, but you don't believe in government. <laughs> Just, okay. Irony is dead, so, isn't it? So the Libertarian, libertarian Party. Um, yeah. Uh, How had is that convention. a thing? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. But they had their convention. And uh, um, RFK Jr. went mm. and delivered his speech. And then uh, Trump went and uh, delivered his speech. And... Um, yeah. He fell flat he, in his face. Yeah, his didn't go well. Um, no, it like, didn't. At all. Um, people, and you have to understand, right? This is not normal for him. Right? He's at mm. Mar-a-Lago where everybody loves him. Whatnot. He got booed once, I think, at a baseball game or something like this. And he's like, it looked like he was going to like run home and cry. Mm-hmm. Right? So uh, his whole thing is everybody loves Trump. <laughs> kind of hard to. Sure they do. So, um, yes, presidential, according to Reuters, presidential candidate Donald Trump was booed and heckled by many in a raucous audience at the Libertarian National Convention on Saturday night, a marked change from the adulation he receives at rallies from his fervently loyal supporters. Libertarians who believe in limited government and individual freedom blame Trump, a Republican, for rushing through the creation of a COVID-19 vaccine when he was president and for not doing more to stop public health restrictions on the unvaccinated during the pandemic. When Trump took to the stage in Washington, there were loud boos and jeers. A smaller section of the crowd, Trump supporters, cheered him. Shortly before he appeared, one Libertarian Party member shouted, quote, Donald Trump should have taken a bullet. Mm. You know your speech is going to go well when. Mm. Uh, Trump's campaign did not immediately respond to a request for comment about the hostile reception. Libertarians garnered only 1.2% of the national vote in 2022. Uh, about or about 1.8 million votes, but November's election could be decided by just tens of thousands of votes and a handful of battleground states. So Trump, Trump is seeking to peel away some libertarian support, which would go to put the lie to all his braggadocious stuff that, hey, it's, in, it's inevitable. If Donald Trump is willing to go someplace where he's going to get booed and is going to be on camera and broadcast mm-hmm. around the world 24-7 in HD and even in 4K. Yeah. Wow. He desperate. Mm-hmm. He is very, very desperate. Oh, Independent yes. candidate uh, Robert F. Kennedy, who also spoke to the convention on Friday, was hoping to rally support. Libertarian Party Chair Angela McArdle ruled Sunday that Trump was not qualified to be the party's nominee for president because he did not submit nominating papers. So he went over there. He told them to make them their nominee, that they really should be making their nominee. And... Um, that, um, well, unless you don't want to win. Said, if you want to win, you'll make me your nominee. If you don't want to, okay. Yeah. Fine. Just be happy with the, your 3% every four years. And, and I was hearing that and it's like, you're on stage. You're telling, make me your nominee. Now mm-hmm. we find out that you never even sent your nomination paper. So even if they wanted to, they couldn't, uh, like this. And then, but you knew there was no way in hell. So. Like this, and you're sitting there like this, unless you want your 3%. And it's like, that sounds a lot. Very, isn't that literally the political speech version of you want to get, if you, this is, if you want, this is your ticket out of the trailer park. Right. He treated that entire audience like it was Stormy Daniels. Well, what would you expect from him? Anything more? Seriously. You get your 3% every four years. You want to get out of the trailer park? Let me fuck you. Basically, is what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
the reason I didn't file the paperwork for the Libertarian nomination, which I would have absolutely gotten if I wanted it, as everyone could tell by the enthusiasm of the crowd last night, was the fact that as the Republican nominee, I'm not allowed to have the nomination of another party, Trump said on Truth Social. The party selected Chase Oliver, Georgia Senate election candidate in 2022, as the presidential candidate. It said on Sunday in a post on X. And meanwhile, uh, I found out that Jill Stein is apparently still alive and breathing. Really? Yep. I didn't know that. Apparently she got the Green Party nomination as well. Hmm. So she's still around and I'm sitting this, oh, you're still here? Haven't you done enough dumbers the last time? Seriously? Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, Trump, who is pre Trump, says, uh, oh, yeah, in the speech, here, here, here's a juicy one, right? Because of his 88 total felony charges, it was 91, three were struck and down. Oh. 88 felony charges he faces in four federal and state prosecutions, quote, if I wasn't a libertarian, I am now. <sighs> I just don't, I don't. The guy that goes around calling everybody rhinos just says, hey, I'm a libertarian who can be. It's now that I got 88 charges. <sighs> Vote for me. <laughs> Some days I just don't know. I just don't know. Don't know. So yeah, really, can Saucy 88 interesting number to ultimately have? Yeah, oh. no kidding, right? Right? Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> if you know what that means, you know what that means. Eighth oh. letter of the alphabet is H. Two eights means HH, which means yes. mm. I'm not going to say it. Trump Just was put the 14 to... words in there as well, right? Yes. Trump was trying to appeal to libertarians who have more in common with Republican policy positions than Democrats on issues, including taxes and the size of government in what is expected to be a closely fought election. Shit, you know what? If I were Joe Biden, I would have had the balls to go there myself and say, hey, I'm a Democrat. I know you guys won't vote for me, but this guy. Yeah, this guy. <laughs> I figured this year there was no better time to try and come and talk to you because this guy well, the libertarians believe that all taxation is theft and when right. i when i meet somebody and they tell me they're a libertarian i'm like have a nice day and i'm on my way because i'm not i'm not having a conversation no i, I and then people says well that's not very open-minded of you i'm like i don't need to be not with somebody who tells me they don't be, they, that they believe that taxation is theft sorry conversation's over have a nice day take care hmm. and i mean that but we're not we're not continuing this conversation I would ha get more response from a brick wall hmm. because they are so um, embedded with their belief system that all taxation is theft. Yeah. That I want nothing but, to do with them. So we have a situation in a crowd that really doesn't like Biden. Mm -hmm. You have some guy coming up and saying, hey, help me defeat Biden. And that guy's getting booed. Yeah, they don't like anybody. Yeah, but it's like, Seriously, like, mm. I don't like Biden, and you say you're going to help me get rid of Biden, but I so don't like you. I don't like you. They either. don't like Trump more than they don't like Biden. Yeah, they're the none of the. That's love, hard uh, to do. <laughs> and somehow Trump achieved it. Oh my God! And uh, you can tell another reason you you can tell that Trump is really really worried is that uh, he's been ramping up his attacks on Kennedy, which why would he need to give him so much attention if Kennedy was really pulling all those votes away from Biden more than Trump? Trump's appearance at the Libertarian gathering, unusual for a Republican White House candidate, also signaled how seriously he and his campaign take the threat of third-party candidate Kennedy, who has long opposed vaccines and mandates. Kennedy was quickly eliminated from the party's presidential nomination on Sunday. So even the libertarians don't want Kennedy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trump has been ramping up attacks on Kennedy, who is running as an independent, recently calling him a fake anti-vaccination proponent. Kennedy addressed the party on social media on Sunday, writing, quote, while we may not agree on every downstream issue, our core values of peace, free speech, and civil liberties make us natural allies. Ah. 
Libertarian Party organizer said Biden was also invited to speak at the convention, but he declined to attend. See, I would have went this year. Quote, the Libertarian Party can make a big difference. If we unite, we will be unstoppable. Trump said to a mix of applause and jeers. Mm -hmm. Trump said he, quote, he was a Libertarian without even trying to be one and that the Libertarian Party should endorse him. Another line greeted by boos and jeers. Undeterred, Trump poked fun at the crowd, saying that if they did not back him, they would continue to garner just a tiny portion of voter support in national elections. He pledged to put a Libertarian in his cabinet if he wins the election, which was met by cries of bullshit. Trump did get huge applause for one promise. A rallying cry for libertarians is the case of Ross Ulbricht, who was serving a life sentence for creating and operating the website Silk Road, which allowed users to secretly buy and sell drugs and other illegal mm -hmm. products. Libertarians believe Ulbricht's 2015 sentence represents government and jurisdictional judicial overreach. In front of a crowd holding free Ross signs, Trump promised to commute Ulbricht's sentence if he wins back the White House. That should... <laughs> Yep. That's a campaign promise that'll play well in other demographics. He will think? literally say anything. He'll say anything to, to win the second. It, something, there's, a, there's a comment here I want to address um, from James. It says, we should be willing to sit down and talk to the people we have nothing in common with. I don't disagree with you, James. I don't. Yep. I don't at all. When it comes to libertarians, I've tried to have that conversation on multiple occasions with multiple individuals, and the same thing is they refuse to listen to anything I have to say. They are all about the individual. They don't believe in collectivism. They don't believe in society at large. They don't want to contribute. So I don't bother to have waste. I'm not wasting my precious time left on this earth having a conversation with somebody who refuses to listen to reason. It's as simple as that. I'm just, I've, I've said all I'm ever going to say and they, it falls on, it, pardon the expression, but it falls on deaf ears. So I'm, I'm no, no, simple as that. That's my reasoning. Other people may feel differently, but you know, I just, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not wasting my time with that. Now in other news of, um, People, um, oh, her uh, meeting face to face with reality. Uh, I've been trying to find a moment to present this for about twenty five days, <laughs> and we keep on getting like thrown off with other news because it's not like really important news. But given Trump got booed, I thought that this is a uh, this goes. It's a variation on the theme. Mm -hmm. Let's put it this way: uh, our good friend not rupaul i mean rupa she's not our friend <laughs> she's just misunderstood mr oh, grizzly is that what it is yeah. she's just misunderstood do you want me to read all this? she needs is the friendship of a, a, a grizzly and a beaver just like she had the friendship of t-rex well she courted yes. these folks and now they're they're you know the leopards eating people's faces party is now eating her face it, it would appear and uh, she doesn't yeah. seem to understand now um I when did she tweet this? It, this may 2nd may 2nd okay now if you haven't um kits noticed um yeah <clears throat> <laughs> we are doing petty <laughs> ah, here. See, that's what you get for petty. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> there is no question that there is an emerging xenophobic and nativist flank on the Canadian right. Some of these folks have emerged from the Freedom Convoy, and some are part of Diagonal. So, uh, yeah, what we're getting here, kids, is a, a bit of a uh, confession. For the most part, these people are a joke, just like their fictitious meme country Diagalon. Relative to some conservatives in the U.S. pushing the envelope on social issues, these people are mediocre and not especially smart. They're just angry and bitter all the time at their precarity. Mm. Moment to allow that sink in. They have nothing intelligent or constructive to offer moment to let that sink in. Again, as I've 
<laughs> in recent months, they have made it clear that they despise people of color, immigrants, Jews, and other non-Christians. And for some reason, they have a visceral hatred of Hindus. You don't say. <clears throat> Again, as I've said many times, it's important to call out, as I myself have over the years, Canada's out-of-control immigration, call out immigrants breaking the law, are going on the dole as soon as they arrive here. Those who have not adapted to Canadian social norms, DEI and woke progressives trying to destroy core Western values that built this country. But when it tips over into nativism because someone is un-Canadian simply because they're not white or Christian or don't belong to one of the two main groups in Canada, Anglo-Saxon or French-Canadian, then you know where they're really coming from. There are the good bigots and then there are the bad bigots and I'm one of the good bigots. Kind of what she's saying. Uh... Oh. Having said that, I'm sure Pierre Polyev's team are aware of this development. Pierre has explicitly denounced people who hold such views in the past, especially those who belong to Diagon, and they in turn despise him because they see him as a sellout and not conservative enough. For now, these folks seem to be doubling down on the PPC, but it's good to be aware that this radical fringe does exist, and time will tell how consequential they become and how representative they are of the wider spectrum of conservative opinion in Canada. Then later on, many reactions to this post, as you would expect, are very defensive. How can it be possible that there are bad apples on our side when we stand for virtue and oppose the race of progressive woke? Guess what? There are bad apples on your side who are playing the same divisive games as the woke. And the only person who benefits this from this is Justin Trudeau, whose strategy always has been to fight and conquer. It's not Canada, which presumably is what you care about. Oh, Lord, girl, sister. I mean, if someone like me who has lived in Canada for most of my adult life is being called an invited guest or that I'm not fully integrated into Canadian society and that I should go back to India for standing up for religious freedom in Canada when in fact I've stood up for Canadian values, history, culture, and for freedom convoy, etc., then we're looking at something that is very ugly and divisive and the folks saying this are not anonymous. They are quite prominent and forthright in their views. I will defend their right to free speech, but equally I have a right to judge their speech. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. Did you just wake up and smell your armpits, girl? I think she did. No, but again, none of this applies to her. No, right? It's all about others. She's like, I say, like, you've literally just said here what I've been saying all the time. A phrase that I paraphrased that I've taken from Brittany Packett. Mm -hmm. White women. When you speak about white women. The level of your devotion to the cause, how devout you are, how religious you are, whatnot, will not save you, ultimately, from what the white patriarchy has in store for you. Nope. Rupa, if someone like me who has lived in Canada for most of my adult life is being called an invited guest or that I'm not fully integrated into Canadian society and that I should go back to India, yeah, welcome to not being white. <sighs> I... She's experiencing it for the In first time ever, it would seem. You're almost there, Rupa. You're almost there. I don't think she'll make it. They save you for last. There's no point in being in denial. Much better to acknowledge the reality on your side than close your eyes to it in the end. We all, we all want is what we all want is what's best for Canada. And that's what we should remain focused on rather than playing divisive politics and falling into Trudeau's trap. Oh, okay, sweetheart. so. So we have woke Rupa here. I didn't think that was ever going to be a thing. <laughs> woke Rupa. Yeah. Never thought I'd hear that. Yet here we are. Yeah, here we are. I guess she's like, I'm just like, she, the part where she says like, for some reason, for some reason, this is happening. And that reason is you're not white. Mm -hmm. It's something with which you had absolutely no problem, Rupa, until Hindus, for some reason, started yeah. to be being affected. Gee, I wonder what has been happening in the news lately. Mm -hmm. That involves India. That could have some people all of a sudden deciding that they want to turn 
their racist canon your way. Everybody Didn't gets a taste of the bitch pudding eventually. We told them what would happen. We said, when they are done with you, you're next. Nobody listens. Ba blam! Everybody gets a taste of the bitch pudding eventually. Mm -hmm. Nervous now that the leopards are licking your face to sample how it tastes? Yeah, that's what it boils down to, right? Again, and we keep on saying it, and you keep on calling us divisive like this, and all we did was try to warn you about the people you're hanging around with, the company you keep. Mm -hmm. It's just the white conservative party of Canada has a MGTOW fetish. Have you not noticed that, Rupa? Clearly she has not. Or she's, you are, she's chosen to ignore it. Yes, and she's still saying, I hope Pierre will notice this. Like this. Pierre is not going to save you. Pierre is the one that put the, had the MGTOW things put on his accounts. Lady. Girlfriend, he stopped in to the Diagonal fans trailer looking one way and came out all disheveled. I don't know if he hit the bong with them while he was in there or had a couple shots or what happened like this, but he certainly came out looking a whole and staggering. Mm -hmm. Not so whatever he was enough to not to notice that he probably shouldn't get them taking video of him next to the fuck Trudeau flag. He wanted the other angle, but uh, having difficulty standing just in one spot to take pictures. Well, Rupa, let me tell you, to write, I'll give it to you straight. He's just not that into you. He's never going to date you. You're not his type. You're a woman. So she's acknowledging that the same people that we acknowledge exist. She's just not acknowledging that she's part of them. Mm -hmm. Well, and of course, she'd be the one that they'd, they'd trot out and say, look at my friend who's a person of color. You know, they would damn well do that. No, I'm not. I'm not racist. Look at my friend here. This is a person of color who's a friend of mine. No, no, that's just a cudgel you use until you don't need it anymore. You don't care about her. You never did. And now she's finding it out. Yep. Upon learning that bots and fringe loudmouth wackadoodles on Twitter who gifted her the profile she so enjoys don't and can't read because, <laughs> again, this is another one of it. What part of they're just a joke like their fictitious meme country do you not understand? But the people who created this meme are real and make their views well known, so being dismissive is more than a little disingenuous. So now she, she was getting into Twitter wars with people. Mm -hmm. here. Actually, here, Mr. Grilla, I will do this. Just to give it, get an idea, get some cups because we've all felt this, right? This Nicole Navy. It's two or three guys who made a joke in a country of forty million. Why generalize that to conservatives? Bigotry's not new. My grandpa almost fled back to Russia due to communist paranoia that made it impossible to work outside of mining. Now it's easier to get work if a minority. Another one. Is there something in the water? Because none of you seem to be able to read. <laughs> Any of you on social media having to deal with this crew ever had that feeling? Mm -hmm. She had an epiphany on May 2nd at 4.49 p.m. Her time. Note it. I think she's stationed here in Ottawa. Yes. Is there something in the water? Because none of you seem to be able to read, or even if you're able to read, you don't seem to be able to comprehend what part of time will tell how consequential they become and how representative they are of the wider spectrum of conservative opinion. Do you not understand? And blah, blah, blah. If everyone's under misunderstanding the message, isn't it possible you weren't clear as to what you were trying to say? Yeah. The people who gifted her the profile she enjoys don't and can't read. She dared just once to tweet something real, and everything she's been spending all those years building started to crumble. She's losing all of her sunny day pals. Funny how that works out, huh? <sighs> Live by the sword. Die by the sword. Mr. Grizzly, now I will elegantly ask you to take over for a couple of seconds as I go off camera and remove this while trying to keep my hair. <laughs> I have uh, something that's somewhat related to what we were just discussing here. It's in a roundabout way. And this is a headline from earlier this morning. 
Ottawa Way's citizenship path for undocumented migrants. The federal cabinet is mulling a plan to give thousands of undocumented migrants in Canada official citizenship status. Under the proposal, people who entered Canada legally but stayed after their visas expired, including international students, are expected to be eligible for official status. While there's no concrete tally, the number of undocumented migrants in Canada is estimated to be as high as 500,000. Why it matters? Well, the government signaled as early as 2021 that it would look to give undocumented migrants a path to citizenship, but the move now comes amid a sharp downturn in public support for immigration. So far this year, the feds have announced a steep cut in the number of international student visas it will issue, along with a tighter limit on temporary workers. Now, let's look at the international student visas. A lot of them are coming to these strip mall colleges that Doug Ford allowed to exist because, you know, there was money to be made. Anyway, advocates argue that offering undocumented workers citizenship could inject billions into the economy by freeing them up to find better paying jobs. And here's the catch. Here's, here's, here's the, uh, the caveat or the catch or I think the ultimate reason that this is going to be occurring. It could also create a new stream of tax revenue by reducing under-the-table cash payments. I think that's the interesting fact that nobody is talking about. You know, you'll have people who say, we're, or we have too many immigrants, and then say, we're not having enough babies. So, so which is it? Oh, I get it. The immigrants aren't white enough for you, and we're not having enough white babies. So when the immigrants come in, who are of working age, by the way, and they have children here, but they don't look the color you want them to look. That's what you get upset about. Too many immigrants. We need more babies. They, they don't... Do they realize how racist they sound when they make a statement like that? I don't think they do. I don't think they're self-aware enough to recognize it. I mean, that's mm. my take. Mm. You, you tell mm-hmm. me. You know. mm mm-hmm. I would agree. I mean, first of all, the consistency is not, a, you know, I think we've clearly established that on the show for a long time now. That consistency to, to over time, a bit. consistency, yeah. consistency over time and over subjects is not exactly the strong suit. No, no. <laughs> of this movement. Oh my word. Uh, how much time do we have, Mr. Grizzly? Uh, about 10 minutes, I guess. Okay. We are going to move to some good news, some sports ball stuff and happy stuff. Um, lots of stuff going on with hockey, of course. The Memorial Cup has started, which is uh, the big tournament for uh, Canada, I guess. Uh, is that called junior hockey, I guess? Junior, yes. Yeah, right. Um, so we have uh, the four teams that are competing over there at the Memorial Cup. Um I'm not sure where it's being held this year. I don't know, really actually, weird. to be honest with you. I didn't... Uh... Yeah. Uh, no, I can't tell where it's being held this year. Hold on, I'll have to look that up. Uh, but we have the Drummondville Voltijar, the Saginaw Spirit, uh, the Moose Jaw Warriors, and the London Knights. Those are the four teams that have uh, um, qualified, that have won uh, their respective uh, league championships. So... Um, I'm hoping uh, that it is a good tournament over there. Uh, I still can't. I've, I've looked at five different websites while I'm doing this, and I still can't find what city it's in. That is terrible. Oh, well. Don't know where it's being held. Somebody might be able to tell me. Uh, then uh, in the PWHL, uh, yeah, exactly. P- PWHL game last night was crazy set. Uh, Linda M. I believe it went into two overtimes. No, I, I think uh, for the series to be tied, uh, going to a final game five. Uh, so Minnesota and Boston are tied there. And um, it seems that uh, things have been uh, doing very well. It seems that the, the average uh, arena has been selling about uh, just under 6,000 seats uh, per game all throughout the league. Uh, mm-hmm. It seems that New York is the one that has the, the toughest one. Uh, they've been playing at three different arenas, actually. Um, so well, that's, that's uh, difficult. 
mm. yeah, to, to get a following. Uh, but in Canada, the uh, I believe uh, like the Toronto team, I think their average is nine thousand something, and so they're going to be moving into the the bigger arena, the eight thousand seat arena that they've played a couple of uh, games at because the first Coliseum. arena was like just. 2,500. The Coca-Cola thing or something? The, uh, yeah, it's where the Marlies play. Is it Coca-Cola yeah. Coliseum? What do we call I guess it's Coca-Cola. Yeah. Um, they yeah. were playing at Mattamy Homes, which is uh, in the old Maple Leaf Gardens, but on the upper level because Maple Leaf Gardens, the lower level is now a Loblaws, I think, or something like that. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, but according to the CBC, there's an article here if people want to read it. Uh, it was written by the Associated Press inaugural PWH season deemed a success. Uh, so yes, uh, the 16 PWHL is riding high following a season in which it averaged 5,448 fans per game, including a women's hockey record of 21,105 at Montreal's Bell Centre last month. Uh, it's reached sponsorship deals with more than 40 companies. Uh, they will be choosing their uh, their logos and uh, mm -hmm. team jerseys and names and stuff like that over the course of the summer. Um, so they've had uh, and they have a, a draft coming on June tenth. Uh, uh, no, June eleventh. No award ceremony. Draft. Yeah, draft in St. Paul, Minnesota, on June tenth, followed by its award ceremony a uh, day later. Um, so that's going on as well. Uh, they are going. They're it seems that they're going to have an influx of new prospects with college graduates and Europeans, but uh, the league isn't considering expansion until season three at the earliest. So uh, they're going to have an overabundance of choice of players for the six teams here. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we might see new teams in the next couple of years too. in new yeah. cities. Yeah. That's why they're saying year three, maybe there'll be some expansion. Uh, so this sense. will be year two In year two, the team, each team will go from playing 24 games to at least 30 uh, the season will be expected to be open in early December at the latest, and there's the promise the league will schedule more neutral site games after playing a few in Detroit and Pittsburgh uh, this year. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, so it's having some success. That is great. So we'll hear more. But uh, yes, the and oh, we were asking about the, the Walter Cup because I was like, why is the cup named after a guy? It's named after the Walter family. So in this case, Walter is the last name not a first name, and they, they put in a, a lot of money uh, to be able to start the league. I think they're the main financial, uh, the main financial factor there. Um, at the International Ice Hockey Federation Championships, unfortunately, Canada left without medals, uh, losing their last two games, uh, losing against a Sweden in a, not Sweden, Switzerland in overtime uh, to not qualify for the gold and play for the bronze instead, and then lost to Sweden in the bronze. Uh, so uh, fourth place finish for Team Canada at the World Hockey Championships. And that's after going 7-0 and in the round robin. They just The wheels sort of fell off at the end. Well, and you also have to consider this is a team that was thrown together just a couple of weeks ago, yes. too, right? Because yes. they're, they're, they're players who have been eliminated or did not make the uh, Stanley Cup playoffs. Yeah. So, and they had a trouble with beating Team Austria. That game was 7 6 and went to overtime. Well, Austria. And, you know, Ottawa's Ottawa. <laughs> Canada has won that title many, many times. Oh yeah! And uh, if if you also consider the uh, Spengler Cup, which is at Christmas time, yes, which is the oldest Challenge Cup in all of Europe in hockey, uh, Canada has won that more than anybody else. And that is a team of Canadian players that play on European squads that get thrown together at the last minute too. And yet we've won it more times than anybody. So yeah, we're still pretty good at hockey. We're still, we're still pretty, pretty good at hockey. And then, of course, the Oilers. Yes. Yay! The Edmonton Oilers are set to host the Dallas Stars tonight for Game 3 in the Western Conference Final, tied at one apiece. What is it with Dallas scoring late third-period goals? I don't know. That's the one that, that set the other the first match in overtime, and this one it allowed Dallas to win. Come on, man. But it's going to be the first Conference Finals game in Canada since the Oilers faced off against Colorado two years ago, and the Oilers haven't made it to the Cup Finals since 2006, so... Hopefully, 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 go Oilers, go. Um, in volleyball, World League Volleyball, after the first week of play, it's uh, the 16 top nations in the world play each other round robin and then, you know, playoffs and whatnot for volleyball supremacy. Uh, Team Canada is in seventh place uh, for the men and fourth place for the women. Uh, at the French Open, it's the second, uh, second day of uh, competition. Uh, Gabrielle Diallo made it out of the qualifications and then got a good slash bad draw. 
he drew the 320 something player in the world, which is usually good because I mean, this is like the premier, like the 110 best tennis players, if they're not injured, are all there, right? To start with. Uh, so that's a good draw, uh, except uh, 325 is Kei Nishikori, who's coming back from injury, or he used to be number five in the world. Uh, so it went, it was a five set marathon, uh, but Diallo did eventually lose it. Uh, Bianca Andrescu is going to be playing her first match in nine months this morning, returning to the courts. Leila Annie Fernandez will also be playing today. Uh, Felix Ogielia Sim was on the court uh, while uh, while we were uh, uh, do, starting the podcast. It was a rain delay, but he was uh, two points ahead from uh, going up 2-1, two, uh, two zero in sets there. And Dennis Shapovalov is also scheduled to play today. So four of the five uh, Canadians registered in the main draw and singles are playing today uh, with one already being eliminated. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's all the good news I have from the sports ball world. So, Mr. Grizzly, unless you have something, I think we have a show. I have a quick clip I wanted to share with you. Um, it's interesting. It's about housing in Alberta okay. and how there's, you know, the housing shortage that we're told. This is from uh, at the underscore leaf blower from the TikTok. Have a look at this. Oops. Let's vacancy start it rates are at record lows. No. I got it. Guys, there is no housing shortage. Sure, vacancy rates are at record lows. In Calgary, it's 1.4% for purpose-built rental units. 1.4% of what, though? 51,295, leaving 718 empty units. Do the same for condos. 1% of 29,373 is 293 empty condos. That's over 1,000 empty rental units in Calgary as of February 2024. And that doesn't include secondary suites, Airbnbs, or recreational property. Let's do the same for Edmonton. 2,576 empty rental units. There's also something they call unabsorbed housing stock, which basically means houses that have been built but haven't been sold. In Calgary, that's another 1,000 empty homes. In Edmonton, another 2,000. Something that absolutely blew my fucking mind was this census data from 2021, because they only do a census every five years. Take a look at the total private dwellings in Alberta versus the total occupied private dwellings. 139,450 unoccupied private dwellings, empty homes. Wake up, guys. This is artificial scarcity, not a supply issue. Homelessness is a feature of the system, not a bug. I thought that Dang. was interesting. And uh, there's, a, there's a graphic I want to share as well that I thought was... Well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to argue with this uh, graphic. I think it actually makes perfect sense. Let's see if I can get it here on the screen. There we go. This is an interesting graphic. I'll read it to you because, you know, you want to hear it. And it says, homelessness sets the floor for everyone's wages. Fear of homelessness right. keeps poorer workers in line. Middle class get told poor workers are unskilled, so they don't deserve to have livable wages while the rich keep profit created by both of them. You know, I... That's, uh, yeah. Yeah, right? Well, Crazy. Bleak, but yep. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> yeah, yep. All right, kids and cubs. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we loved making this for you. Remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. Uh, we love it when you spread the good word. And uh, we've seen uh, uh, some particularly nice comments over the past little while um, uh, with all the brouhaha that's going on with a whole bunch of other stuff. So uh, thank you, uh, those of you who have taken the time to write uh, those nice of things because we do stumble across them and uh, they give us uh, some really, really, really big warm fuzzies. So uh, thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, if you do not want to miss an episode, you do not have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl who has sponsored our pod page. You go to podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with the hyphen between each one of those words. And uh, if you scan the QR code, if when Mr. Grizzly puts it up, that'll bring you there too. And if you subscribe there, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it will go directly to you. If you happen to need a little more beaver in your life, kids and cubs, well then you need to get some beaver merch at our 
S-T-N-E-B merch store. That's at our Etsy shop, etsy.com slash C-A slash shop slash T-N-E-B merch store. That's all in one word. And if you go there, we have a whole bunch of items with uh, our show's logo so that if you have it and you're walking around town, people will go, hey, there's an informed Canadian. That's really sexy. It works, I'll tell you. And if you would like to support us in other ways, then please go to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page if you haven't already and subscribe. Also click like and share while you're there. Make like Kit Elaine. And that would help us a lot. We're trying to get to a thousand, hopefully before Canada Day. So please, 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 any bit that you can do uh, to help. Thank you. It means the world to us. And if you scan the QR code that's right there by Mr. Grizzly's head, that will bring you to our coffee page if you happen to like our show and would like to encourage us to do more. Uh, we do uh, depend on your donations to help cover our costs. If you would uh, like to encourage us to do more, then uh, if you scan that QR code or go to coffee, ko-fi.com slash eagerbeaver, lowercase letters, all in one word, you will find our tip jar. Uh, please uh, leave us a little bit there. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Of course, if you can't, you're not able to, the gift of your attention and your participation in the show is the one that we cherish when you send us comments, when you participate in the chat, when uh, you suggest uh, ideas for stories, all of that really means the world to us. So thank you very much. If you'd like to write to us, truenorthegerbeaver at gmail.com. That's where our email address is. And uh, we'd like to read everything. Also, uh, you can reach us on Twitter at TrueEager, our Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver, or leave comments on our uh, YouTube page when you're watching the shows there. Let's see, because democracy is something that you do if you're in Alberta, do uh, get involved in the NDP leadership race if you can. We're down to four candidates, so uh, please uh, fight for uh, the one that uh, you prefer. Thank you so very much, whoever scanned the QR code. We really appreciate that. And uh, if you happen to be living in Saskatchewan, British Columbia, or New Brunswick, there is a provincial election coming up, so please see what you can do to help with the process. It's a really fun experience, especially if you work at a polling station. I've done it once, and I definitely will do it again at some point. So uh, I encourage you to do it if you haven't yet. And if you have and you enjoyed it, uh, let them know early that uh, you're willing to do it this year. All right. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there. So please, 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 please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, some words of wisdom, please. Sorry, I had my mic on mute there. Um, yeah, get out and uh, walk around barefoot in the grass today if you have a chance to do so. Because uh, I guess they call it grounding, but I just call it, you know, getting a little bit in touch with nature as much as possible. And when you're feeling a little bit down, it'll always pick you up. Always works for me anyway, so maybe you can do that today if you're feeling a little down. Just go for a little barefoot walk in the grass. It'll help you. Trust me. I think I will go do that, Mr. Grizzly. And I will I be doing an ASMR this evening. I didn't Good. last week because it was a holiday and I just completely, it felt like a Sunday. And anyway, but I will be doing a show tonight. So if anybody wants to chime in, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard on my personal YouTube channel. Ollie's World 2005, I think is what it is. I can't remember. I should know that, right? You think I should know that, but somehow I don't. I can put up the... There's a, Q, there's a go, QR code I'll there. For you. I can never remember what my own website is. <laughs> it's kind of funny, I think. Anyway. But, yep, uh, yeah, Polly's I will World, be doing a show. Polly's World 2005. There you go. You can find me there for an, an evening um, ASMR show around 9 p.m. tonight. And, yeah, join us then. I have uh, something we can share after this. It's kind of cute. I think you'll like it. It's just... Uh, All right. Let's roll the credits, eh? Mr. Grizzly, please. You are listening to True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated Podcast. The True North Eager Beaver Podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind.
We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. I guess I was about to say Mr. Grizzly Q the cock. I was like in the click. I was like, I was like in the chat room going, dude, my line. <laughs> he goes, sorry, was hovering over the link. Says, nothing good ever comes from hovering over the link, over the body. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I have one, uh, two quick things. I'm going to put this on the screen so you can see it. And uh, this is from Jenny from the block list. It's, uh, I think this is pretty good. I love uh, that. Uh, <laughs> let me just blow it up a little bit here so you can see it better. If the companies that sell educational resources start packing their products in empty beer boxes, and if I change my room number to 7-Eleven, maybe the conservative government will finally make sure my classroom has the materials my students need to learn. Ooh. Room 7-Eleven. Thanks, Doug. I thought Same. that was pretty good. I thought I that like was it. pretty good. And let me get you something. I got I got to show you something. I'll be just right. give me a second here. I'm going to you can entertain everybody while I'm gone for like 30 All seconds. Right. Let me entertain you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, get some cups. Um yeah. Just so you know, um we uh, have a little herb garden uh, now here at the Beaver Lodge. That was the big project this weekend. Uh, we're also looking at getting the, the bigger garden set. Uh, so we're going to have to have about three cubic yards of earth delivered so that we can uh, do the foundation of it. Uh, but uh, we made two little planter areas by the deck, and one of them is an herb garden. And... Uh, so uh, we had a lot of fun with that uh, this week. Unfortunately, it did involve at some times. Uh, ooh, True North Eager Beaver T-shirt with QR code in back. Yes. Yeah, so I walk around downtown wearing that, and people will scan the back of it, hopefully, and take them to the website. So. Yeah, we got some merch. We got some merch. I ordered, uh, I ordered a shirt for uh, Bridget, and they, I ordered one. They sent me two, so cool <laughs> and then mr grizzly if you'll you'll just give this a, a show here so um yeah uh we, we 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 went for something that was supposed to take an hour to hardware stores and stuff like that and it ended up being a five hour ordeal uh but yeah we uh now have a a, a bit of an herb garden so cool. there you go at the beaver lodge all right mr grizzly I think it's time to end the show because this is a really long history. <laughs> I'll see you. Hey, bye everyone. <laughs>